Good evening, it's Thursday, November 18th. A divided House of Representatives finally moves towards passage of President Biden's expansive social and climate change bill today. As new cost estimates from Congress's top fiscal analysts suggest that moderate lawmakers' worries about spending and deficits would be calmed, giving the bill the votes it needs for passage in the chamber, although none of those will come from Republicans. Uh, I rise in strong opposition to this so-called reconciliation bill. This Build Back Better bill, it's nothing more than a sham to push far radical, radical progressive policies on America, on, on policies that America doesn't want and doesn't need. This would be the largest spending bill in our nation's history, the largest tax increase in our nation's history, and it's going to fall on the backs of middle-income and low-income families. Former President Donald Trump endorses Arizona Congressman Paul Gosar one day after the Arizona Republican is censured by the House of Representatives for posting a violent cartoon video that depicted a character with his face killing one with New York Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's. Defense attorneys rest their case in the online Arbery trial today after calling to seven witnesses, including the shooter, who testifies that Arbery did not threaten him in any way before his, he pointed his shotgun at the 25-year-old black man, pulled the trigger, and killed him. Two men who for decades maintained their innocence in the 1965 assassination of civil rights icon Malcolm X exonerated in a New York City courtroom today. Julius Jones's execution in Oklahoma halted less than four hours before he was scheduled to receive a lethal injection following outcry over doubts about evidence at his murder trial nearly 20 years ago. And a wave of COVID-19 cases hitting Europe with a vengeance with a number of countries seeing record numbers of daily infections, imposing partial lockdowns and placing more restrictions on unvaccinated people. From Pacifica Radio, KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. The House of Representatives is moving tonight toward a vote on President Joe Biden's Build Back Better Act. The $1.75 trillion climate and social spending bill is touted by Democrats as a transformational piece of legislation to help working families and to address climate change. Republicans are blasting the measure as socialism. Christopher Martinez reports. President Joe Biden's Build Back Better Act came up for debate in the House of Representatives Thursday, and as expected, it fell out along party lines. On one side, Democrats. The bill before us today marks a triumph for our nation. And on the other, Republicans. This is an absolute disgrace. It's beyond belief of how terrible this moment is. The Build Back Better Act includes Biden's agenda on climate and social programs. It has more than half a trillion dollars to address climate change, $400 billion for child care and preschool, and expansions in health care. Democrat Pramila Jayapal of Washington is chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus. She says the bill tells families, we have your back. For example, cutting the cost of child care and prescription drugs, as well as taking on housing, climate change, and more. And for the first time in 35 years, we say to immigrants, you are truly essential, not expendable, and we will protect dreamers, TPS holders, essential workers, and farm workers. Republicans were united in opposition to the measure. Republican Lauren Boebert of Colorado dismisses the bill as this junk and Biden's broke back budget. I think they've lost their ever-loving minds. $7.8 billion for environmental justice going towards woke universities, 100 billions for amnesty workarounds as our southern border is completely invaded by nearly 2 million illegal aliens, many of them criminal 
aliens. There's 550 billion for Green New Deal policies. Andrew Garbarino is a Republican from New York. He calls the bill a sham to push what he calls far radical progressive policies. This would be the largest spending bill in our nation's history, the largest tax increase in our nation's history, and it's going to fall on the backs of middle-income and low-income families. And for what? A massive government takeover, 150 new programs when we can't even uh, work the programs we have now well. It would grant amnesty to 7 million illegal immigrants and put billions into the Green New Deal. Republicans largely tarred the bill as representing socialism, but Democrats reject those claims. Democrats have a plan to serve the American people. Republicans have an agenda to stop Democrats, period. Kentucky Democrat Jim Yarmuth, chair of the House Budget Committee, alluded to the recent vote on an infrastructure bill, saying last week Republicans claimed building infrastructure is a socialist activity. And now child care is socialist, public education is socialist, caring for our seniors is socialist, dealing with climate change is socialist. Um, I'd like to get a definition from uh, my Republican colleagues about what socialism is because um, the American people see this very differently and virtually every poll on this piece of legislation has shown overwhelming support for each of the elements that we are proposing. After hours of debate, the House took a break while a committee reviewed a Congressional Budget Office analysis that some moderate Democrats had wanted to see before they vote. Next came more debate, with a final House vote expected later Thursday night. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. A new report shows that child care and home health care workers are deeply undervalued and underpaid. The Economic Policy Institute report comes as Congress debates the Build Back Better Act, which includes historic investments in child care and home health care to lower the costs to families. The Institute's survey says that the average hourly wage for early care and education Education workers and home health care workers is $13.51 and $13.81. That's about half the economy-wide average hourly wage. For a full-time worker, it translates to less than $30,000 a year. The report notes that 94% of child care workers are women, disproportionately black and Latina, when it comes to home health care, 88% of workers are women, also disproportionately black and Latina. The Institute notes that immigrants account for a large number of child and home health care workers, just under a third of home health care workers and more than 20% of child care workers are born outside the United States. The Senate was expected to begin debate today on a whopping $778 billion military policy bill after it cleared a procedural hurdle yesterday. That vote, 84 to 15. Independent Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders contrasted that overwhelming bipartisan support for the massive military bill to the opposition in some quarters to spending on expanding Medicare or paying for family leave, community college, or climate programs, such as found in the Build Back Better legislation. Now, isn't it remarkable how even as we end the longest war in our nation's history, the war in Afghanistan, concerns about the deficit and the national debt seemed to melt away under the influence of the military-industrial complex. People sleeping out on the street, people dying because they don't have any health care, kids unable to get the early childhood education they need, not a problem. Can't afford to pay for those things. But somehow, when it comes to the defense budget and the needs of the military industrial complex, we just cannot give them enough money. The $778 billion military policy bill is $37 billion more than former President Trump's last military spending bill, $25 billion more than President Biden and the Pentagon had even requested. 
The Interior Department has held the first oil and gas drilling lease auction of the Biden administration. Shell, BP, Chevron, and ExxonMobil offered a combined $192 million for drilling rights on tracks in the Gulf of Mexico, totaling nearly 2,700 square miles. Since it takes years before crude is pumped, the leases could produce oil and gas long past the year 2030, when scientists say the world needs to have drastically cut greenhouse gas emissions to stave off a climate disaster. The administration has proposed another round of oil and gas sales early next year in Wyoming, Colorado, Montana, and other states. Emissions from burning and extracting fossil fuels from public lands and waters account for about a quarter of U.S. carbon dioxide emissions. That's according to the U.S. Geological Survey. The climate justice group Extinction Rebellion tweeted in response that today is the day Joe Biden betrays the whole world. The Center for Biological Diversity called the lease mind-boggling, noting it came in the aftermath of the COP26 climate summit. That group said it's hard to imagine a more hypocritical and dangerous thing for the Biden administration to be doing. Meanwhile, the Build Back Better Act making its way through Congress does include reforms for oil and gas production on public lands, reforms that were first introduced by the Reagan administration. Eric Galatis reports. Dave Jenkins with Conservatives for Responsible Stewardship says the measure includes common sense solutions for so-called orphan wells, sites where companies have walked away from their obligation to clean up after production. They're shifting that cost to you and me. They're making the profit and we're getting the bill. It's not a bunch of bureaucratic red tape. It's a simple fix. All we have to do is require bonding amounts that reflect the actual cost of cleanup and reclamation. There are currently more than 740,000 orphan wells across the U.S., according to the Interstate Oil and Gas Compact Commission. Jenkins explains that after wells are tapped out, many producers declare bankruptcy, which shifts the cost of cleanup to taxpayers. Those same principles then pop up under a new company name and get back to work at new sites. Taxpayers lost out on more than $12 billion in oil and gas revenues between 2010 and 2019, according to analysis by Taxpayers for Common Sense. Build Back Better would increase royalty rates companies pay for extracting resources owned by all Americans. Industry groups have long claimed that higher fees would blunt production, but Jenkins disagrees. Texas, for example, charges double the royalty rate that the federal government does for drilling on state lands in Texas. That hasn't dampened demand for drilling on state lands in Texas at all. Jenkins' group is also calling on the Biden administration to direct the Bureau of Land Management to stop treating public lands as though oil and gas extraction was their sole purpose. So they're not managed for outdoor recreation or hunting or fishing or water supply or grazing. They're being managed for oil and gas. That's an enormous lost opportunity. We should be looking to use our public lands for their highest and greatest use. This is Eric Galatis reporting for the Wyoming News Service. Former President Donald Trump is endorsing Representative Paul Gosar one day after the Arizona Republican was censured by the House of Representatives for posting a violent cartoon video that depicted a character with his face killing one with New York Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's face. Trump, in a statement, hailed Gosar as a loyal supporter of our America First agenda and highly respected in Arizona, and said he has his complete and total endorsement. The statement made no mention of the House's rare rebuke, just the fourth in nearly 40 years, which also stripped Gosar of his two committee assignments on the Natural Resources and the Oversight and Reform Panels. Gosar has said the video, which was produced by his taxpayer-funded office, had been mischaracterized and was not intended to be a threat. In addition to Ocasio-Cortez, the video also depicted Gosar's character attacking President Biden with swords. 
Gosar is no stranger to controversy. He's made appearances at fringe right-wing events, including a gathering in Florida last February hosted by a man who's promoted white supremacist beliefs and earlier this year looked to form an America First caucus with other hardline Republican House members that aim to promote Anglo-Saxon political traditions. Meanwhile, Trump's ex-chief of staff, Mark Meadows, said today that he'd love to see the Speaker of the House title taken from current House Speaker Nancy Pelosi and handed over to Trump. If Republicans win control of the House in next year's election, I would love to see the gavel go from Nancy Pelosi to Donald Trump, Meadows said on Steve Bannon's war room today. People would go crazy. As you know, you don't have to be an elected member of Congress to be the Speaker of the House, said Meadows. Meadows' comments came as the former chief of staff has criticized current Republican leaders in Congress. Speaking today on an episode of Florida Representative Matt Gates's podcast released today, Meadows gave Republican leaders a D grade when it comes to their efforts to combat President Biden's administration. Meadows said, you need to make sure that when you've got the Democrats on the ropes, you don't throw in the white towel of surrender, and that's what happens. Meadows was referring to the vote on the bipartisan infrastructure bill earlier this month, during which 13 Republicans joined Democrats to vote for the bill. Later in the podcast, Meadows said, if you're going to be the Speaker of the House, you've got to be able to control those members. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno, online at kpfa.org. Julius Jones's execution in the state of Oklahoma was halted today less than four hours before he was scheduled to receive a lethal injection. Following an outcry over doubts about evidence at his murder trial nearly 20 years ago. The clock was ticking for Jones as Oklahoma's Republican Governor Kevin Stitt weighed whether to spare his life. Shortly after noon, the governor announced he had granted Jones clemency. Instead of allowing the execution to proceed, Stitt said he was commuting Jones's sentence to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Jones, 41 years old, was convicted and sentenced to die for the 1999 shooting death of Paul Howell, a businessman from an affluent Oklahoma City suburb. Jones has consistently maintained his innocence. The case has increasingly drawn attention since it was profiled in The Last Defense, a three-episode documentary produced by actress Viola Davis that aired on ABC in 2018 and outlined some of his defense team's allegations. Since then, reality television star Kim Kardashian West, who visited Jones in prison, and athletes with Oklahoma ties, including... National Basketball Association stars Russell Westbrook, Blake Griffin, and Trey Young have urged Governor Stitt to commute Jones's death sentence and spare his life. Last week, the ambassador of the European Union to the United States sent a letter to Stitt urging him to grant Jones's clemency. Reporter Tony Waterman has more. Governor Stitt had faced mounting pressure to intervene in Jones's execution, which was meant to take place at 5 o'clock Eastern time on Thursday. In an 11th hour statement, Stitt said he was commuting the death sentence after prayerful consideration and reviewing materials presented by all sides of the case. Jones was convicted of killing businessman Paul Howell during a carjacking in 1999, but has maintained his innocence throughout. The Oklahoma Pardon and Parole Board had recommended his sentence be reduced to life in prison earlier this month. The case has attracted national attention, including from celebrities like Kim Kardashian. Tony Waterman, Washington. Jones's looming execution had prompted high school students across Oklahoma City to walk out of their classes yesterday. Prayer vigils were held at the state capitol and barricades were erected outside the governor's mansion. 
The state's Pardon and Parole Board had twice voted 3-1 to one to recommend the governor grant clemency to Jones and commute his sentence to life in prison. A prosecutor says a Tennessee inmate will no longer face <coughs> execution over the slings of a mother <coughs> and a daughter more than 30 years ago because of claims that he is intellectually disabled. Shelby County District Attorney Amy Weirich announced that Purvis Payne will instead face two consecutive life sentences in prison. The prosecutor said her office received information last week that the state's expert could not say that Payne's intellectual functioning is outside the range for intellectual disability. The U.S. Supreme Court in 2002 found executions of the intellectually disabled violate the Eighth Amendment's ban on cruel and unusual punishment. Tennessee Governor Bill Lee signed a bill this summer making the state's law retroactive and prohibiting the execution of the intellectually disabled. In the Ohio legislature today, a bill to abolish the death penalty in the state was set to have its fourth hearing. Mary Sherman reports. The House Criminal Justice Committee will hear from interested parties on HB 183, which has a companion bill in the Senate. Advocates of abolition include the Reverend Dr. Crystal Walker with Greater Dayton Christian Connections, whose son was murdered in 2013. She says the death penalty cannot bring him back, and she would not want his killer's family to feel the loss she feels. All it does is cause sorrow and pain to another family, and we have to stop this. Because someone loves the perpetrator as much as they love the victim. Opponents of repeal argue the death penalty is reserved for the worst of the worst offenders and say ending it would put serial killers or mass murderers on the same level as someone else committing an aggravated murder. Ohio hasn't held an execution since 2018 due to problems acquiring a suitable drug for lethal injections. Jonathan Mann with Ohioans to Stop Executions says he struggled with the moral implications of the death penalty after his father was murdered in 2017. He contends that it isn't a deterrent adding there currently is no legal means for executions in the state. The cocktail of drugs that have been previously used for lethal injection have been referred to as barbaric and inhumane. And what we're talking about here from the death penalty's perspective and ending lives is philosophically humane ways to do that. That currently does not exist. When Melinda Elkins Johnson's mother was murdered in 1998 in Barberton, her husband was falsely accused and looking at the death penalty. She says no one believed her claims that he was innocent and didn't view her as a victim herself. Not one time did victim's assistance or the prosecutor's office attempt to contact me for any reason. I was given no services. I was completely a pariah in their eyes. Proponents of repeal argue that money used for executions should be redirected to provide assistance to victims' families, including mental health care, and money to pay for funeral costs, mortgages, or tuition. For Ohio News Connection, I'm Mary Sherman. Defense attorneys for the three white men in Georgia accused of killing black man Ahmad Arbery rested today after calling a total of seven witnesses. Those who testified in the men's defense included the man who fatally shot Arbery, Travis McMichael. Meanwhile, outside the courtroom, hundreds of black pastors gathered for a vigil for Arbery's family. After one of the defense attorneys earlier in the week told the judge he didn't want any more black pastors in the courtroom. KPFA's Christina Anastad files this report. We thank you now, oh God, that we seek justice for this family, God. God, we pray that you'll speak to every person in the jury. God, we're looking for a miracle. We're expecting the impossible. An estimated 500 black pastors congregated outside the Glynn County Courthouse in Brunswick, Georgia, where a defense attorney for one of three white men facing murder charges and the killing of a black man, Ahmad Arbery, said he didn't want any black pastors in the courtroom consoling the victim's grieving family. Those pastors are Reverend Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton, who in response called on black pastors around the country to show up in force, and they did. No lawyer can lock us out, because wherever you are, God is already there. And we're going to keep coming till we get justice. 
Come on. He attacked the church. Yeah. He didn't just say enough of the uh, of, of civil rights leaders. He said no more black pastors. No more black pastors. He called them black pastors. He didn't even say he didn't care about white pastors. Well, if you thought one was enough, look at what you brought now. Many carried signs reading Black Pastors Matter, and some wore buttons with Arbery's picture that said justice for Ahmad. Inside the courtroom, attorney Kevin Goff was at it again, arguing black pastors and the weeping family of Arbery would influence the mostly white jury and deny his client, William Roddy Bryan, a fair trial. This time he cited judicial precedent when a judge banned the Nation of Islam leader Louis Farrakhan from courtroom proceedings in 1990. The court is authorized to exclude Reverend Sharpton and Reverend Jackson from the courtroom without a hearing and in the alternative, certainly uh, entitled to do so after a hearing. Uh, and again, in there for the other reasons cited, I have asked the court again to take more robust steps to ensure uh, Mr. Bryan's right to a fair trial. He failed to mention at the time the judge rescinded that ban after the American Civil Liberties Union challenged it. But presiding judge Timothy Walmsley, for the third time, rejected Goff's request. The court's already ruled on the motion at least twice. Uh, I'm looking in the gallery, I don't even see the two individuals that uh, Mr. Goff, um, you have raised um, as issues and the court is not going to address this matter. Outside, black pastors and lawyers defended the family and the right to have pastors in the courtroom. Here are civil rights attorneys Lee Merritt and Benjamin Crump. Wanda Cooper Jones and Marcus Arbery are going into that courtroom to see the men who murdered her son try. Marcus has been the subject of not one, not two, not three, but six different motions. And all they've done is sit quietly in the back of the court and try their best to contain the pain caused by getting into the graphic details of their son's murder. We need the preachers to come and pray that they keep their sanity for this insane situation, this inhumane killing of their child. The three white men on trial, Greg McMichael, his son Travis, and their neighbor, William Bryan, are charged with Arbery's murder. Prosecutors say the McMichaels armed themselves and pursued the 25-year-old black man in a pickup truck after he ran past their home from a house under construction. The defense claims they thought Arbery was a thief. Arbery's family say he was jogging. The case has deepened a national outcry over racial injustice. Travis McMichael took to the stand claiming self-defense, but when prosecutor Linda Dunikowski pushed back, he acknowledged Arbery posed no threat. He's not reaching into his pockets. Run, no ma'am, not running, no ma'am. And he never yelled at you guys? No ma'am. Never threatened you at all? No ma'am. Never good. brandished any weapons? Sorry, you're just trying to finish his answer. Yeah, he did not threaten me verbally, no ma'am. All right. Didn't brandish any weapons? Uh, no, ma'am. Didn't pull out any guns? No, ma'am. Didn't pull out any knife? No, ma'am. Never reached for anything, did he? Uh, no. He just ran? Yes, he was just running. McMichael had previously said Arbery fought him and tried to take his gun. He said he was under the impression that Arbery could be a threat because he was running straight at him. After showing cell phone video of the shooting that shows Arbery running around McMichael's truck, Donikoski also pushed back on Travis's decision to shoot and kill him. You also could have stepped around the back of the truck and followed him in the path that way. Is that right? Yes, but then he would have had an open, unrestricted run around the truck and into my open door, into my pickup truck, and go so, to the truck. So you're telling this jury that a man who has spent five minutes running away from you, you're now thinking is somehow going to want to continue to engage with you, someone with a shotgun, and your father, a man who's just said, stop or I'll blow your f***ing head off, by trying to get in their truck? That's what it shows, yes ma'am. 
After calling seven witnesses, the defense for all three men rested their cases. The jury returns for deliberations Monday. A nine-count indictment charges all three of them with one count of malice murder, four counts of felony murder, two counts of aggravated assault, one count of false imprisonment, and one count of criminal attempt to commit false imprisonment. If they're found guilty, the minimum penalty is life in prison. I'm Christina Onestead. Reporting for KPFA. Today was day three of jury deliberations at Kyle Rittenhouse's murder trial in Wisconsin. They wrapped up without a verdict and will return tomorrow. Rittenhouse faces life in prison for killing two protesters and wounding another during a night of protests against racial injustice and the police shooting of an African-American man. Two mistrial requests from the defense are hanging over the politically and racially fraught case. Last week, the defense asked for a mistrial after saying the prosecutor asked improper questions. A second mistrial motion was sparked by a jury request yesterday to rewatch video in the case. Rittenhouse's attorneys say the defense received an inferior copy of a key video from the prosecution. The judge has not ruled on the request. Lawyers for nine people hurt during the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville have told a jury that white nationalists planned, executed, and then celebrated racially motivated violence that left one counter-protester dead and dozens more injured. The closing arguments came in a lawsuit seeking to hold two dozen white nationalists, neo-Nazis, and white supremacist organizations accountable for the violence that erupted in 2017. Attorneys for the white nationalists say there was no conspiracy in their use of racial epithets and threatening talk in chat rooms before the rally is protected by the First Amendment. Hundreds of white nationalists descended on Charlottesville in August of 2017, ostensibly to protest the city's plans to remove a statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee. During a march on the University of Virginia campus, white nationalists surrounded counter-protesters and threw burning tiki torches at them. The following day, an avowed admirer of Adolf Hitler rammed his car into a crowd of counter-protesters, killing one woman and injuring dozens more. The lawsuit is seeking unspecified monetary damages and a judgment that the defendants violated the plaintiff's constitutional rights. More than half a century after the assassination of Malcolm X, two of his convicted killers were exonerated today after decades of doubts about who was responsible for the civil rights icon's death. Manhattan Judge Ellen Beban dismissed the convictions of Mohammed Aziz and the late Khalil Islam after prosecutors and the men's lawyers said a renewed investigation found new evidence that undermined the case against the men and determined that authorities at the time withheld some of what they knew about the case. Manhattan District Attorney Cyrus Vance Jr. speaking in court today. Today's official acknowledgement that the FBI and NYPD suppressed exculpatory evidence in their possession in 1966, even from the prosecutors, is what led to their wrongful conviction. They would have not been convicted if that information, that exculpatory information, had been disclosed. Not only would it have changed the verdict in this case, but it would change the history of the civil rights movement in this country. Malcolm X was killed in February of 1965 in Harlem. Muhammad Aziz, now 83 years old, and the late Khalil Islam were convicted of murder in 1966, along with a third man. All were sentenced to life in prison. The third man said he was one of three gunmen who shot Malcolm X, but he testified that neither Aziz nor Islam were involved. Aziz was released in 1985. Islam, two years later, he died in 2009. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF, Fresno, online at kpfa.org. It's an hour-long newscast that airs each night at 6 o'clock. I'm Mark Miracle.
Deere and company workers have approved a new contract that will deliver 10% raises immediately and end a month-long strike for more than 10,000 employees. The United Auto Workers Union members voted 61% in favor of the deal with the tractor maker. It was the third vote on a contract offer. The new contract covers 12 plants in Iowa, Illinois, and Kansas where the company's iconic John Deere equipment is made. Today was the first day of a two-day sympathy strike by thousands of Kaiser healthcare workers and nurses to support striking Kaiser Local 39 operating engineers. Engineers have been on strike for two months. Today, members of SEIU United Healthcare Workers West staged a one-day sympathy strike. Tomorrow, registered nurses from the CNA, the California Nurses Association, will follow suit. The rally outside Kaiser facilities. In an email to members, Kaiser says it may have to reschedule some elective surgeries, non-urgent appointments, or change in-person appointments to a phone or video visit. Earlier this week, Kaiser settled tentative contracts with its pharmacists and separately with an alliance of unions representing 50,000 other Kaiser Permanente workers in Kaiser, Oregon, and six other states. In Missouri, a new group is aiming to bridge racial and geographic divisions among workers to help work together for economic prosperity for all. Lily Bolke has that story. The newly launched Missouri Worker Center says it's pushing back against stereotypes and myths that can divide workers who share common interests. The group was joined at its first event by Heather McGee, author of The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. She says there is, in her words, a lie that prosperity for some has to come at the expense of others. McGee says it's being used to pit groups against each other, so fighting for fair working conditions and combating racism go hand in hand. 40% of American workers are paid too little to meet their basic needs for things like housing and food. 1% of the population owns more wealth than the entire middle class. Missouri's minimum wage is $10.30 an hour after voters in 2018 approved a ballot initiative increasing the minimum wage to $12 an hour by 2023. It was previously $7.85. The Missouri Worker Center says it will advocate for such policies as paid leave and better working conditions. Terrence Wise, a leader with the Missouri Worker Center who works at a McDonald's location in Kansas City, says prior to his introduction to organizing for a better wage, his workplace was segregated by the misperceptions that if black workers are thriving, white workers are losing, or if immigrant workers are thriving, U.S.-born workers must be missing out. Not realizing at the time that we didn't sign each other's paychecks, we didn't write policy and legislation that dictate how our everyday lives were. All that was above us, the corporations, the elected leaders. Wise adds it was important to realize that workers have to come together to demand change. In his own career, he says it's made the difference of earning $16 an hour instead of less than eight. Wise says campaigns like Fight for 15 in a Union are making similar progress across the nation. This is Lily Bolke with Missouri News Service. A surge in COVID-19 cases in the upper Midwest has some Michigan schools keeping students at home ahead of Thanksgiving and the military sending medical teams to Minnesota to relieve hospital staffs overwhelmed by COVID-19 patients. The worsening outlook in the Midwest comes as booster shots are being made available to everyone in a growing number of locations. Massachusetts and Utah became the latest states to say anyone 18 or older can roll up a sleeve for a booster shot. And an advisory committee for the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is meeting tomorrow to discuss expanding boosters. Cold weather states are dominating the fresh wave of cases over the last seven days, including New Hampshire, North Dakota, and Wisconsin, according to federal data. But the Southwest also has trouble spots with more than 90% of inpatient hospital beds occupied in the state of Arizona. In Detroit, Michigan, where only 35% of eligible residents have been fully vaccinated, the school district said it would switch to online learning on Fridays in the month of December because of rising COVID-19 cases, a need to clean buildings, and a timeout for mental health relief. 
One high school has changed to all online learning until the end of November. Los Angeles Mayor Eric Garcetti says the coronavirus surge is likely during the upcoming holiday season and is urging residents to get vaccinated to keep case numbers and hospitalizations down. Garcetti just returned from quarantine overseas after developing a breakthrough case of COVID-19 in Scotland, where he had traveled to attend the Glasgow International Climate Summit. Garcetti used his own experience as a pitch to adults to get a booster dose. I certainly was waiting for a Saturday that I wasn't working, and many of you will appreciate, I don't really have Saturdays that I don't work, so I put it off, and I got COVID while I was in the United Kingdom. Do it, and do it now. Make sure, especially those of us that were vaccinated earlier in the year, like myself in January, have the protections because all of the vaccines wear off over time. Their efficacy lowers each month. A booster can help bring you up to, for this winter surge, the highest level of protection for you and your family. Los Angeles County case numbers, hospitalizations, and deaths are much better than during a surge in July, the last time Mayor Garcetti gave a COVID-19 briefing. But he warned that colder temperatures and more time spent indoors raises the risk of spreading the infection. Garcetti also urged people to get visiting out-of-town family members vaccinated if they aren't already inoculated. The mayor reported a high rate of compliance by customers required under new rules to show proof of vaccination at a wide variety of businesses in the city. The Safe Pass LA mandate to guard against renewed virus spread went into effect last week for restaurants, theaters, gyms, and salons. Garcetti also said a vaccine mandate for city employees was working, with workers overwhelmingly getting their shots. He said there are 77 city employees on unpaid leave under the mandate, and that number could hit around 700 over the next couple of weeks. Students with disabilities in Douglas County, Colorado, won some time after a federal judge ruled last week that a new county health department order making mask wearing optional in schools would put students at risk of irreparable harm. But their safe harbor may not last very long. Eric Galatis reports. With a new conservative-leaning school board set to take over at the end of the month, that reprieve could be short-lived. David Monroe with Disability Law Colorado says if the new board decides to embrace the health order, students and families would be back at square one. What's at stake here is the right for especially students with disabilities to have a right to get the same public education every other child does, but to get that education in an atmosphere which is is safe to them, does not compromise or jeopardize their health. Families of students with disabilities and the Douglas County School District took the county's new health department to court arguing that making masks optional was a violation of the 1990 Americans with Disabilities Act. Last week, a U.S. district judge ordered the health department to stop enforcement of the order for 14 days. County health officials disagreed with the judge's decision and claimed the order strikes the right balance between public health and parental choice. Children with disabilities frequently face serious health challenges, and Monroe says many parents pulled their kids out of school during COVID surges, uncertain if mask mandates were being followed. But when kids aren't in school, Monroe says they're losing out on their right to an appropriate public education. They are children who have had health issues that may leave them immunosuppressed or immunocompromised. They can be at a much higher risk of having a very serious health outcome if they get COVID. Douglas County School District's president welcomed the court's temporary restraining order and said in a statement that no one should have to choose between sending their children to school and putting their health at risk. This is Eric Galatis reporting for the Colorado News Connection. The latest wave of COVID-19 cases is hitting Europe with a vengeance, with a number of countries seeing record numbers of daily infections, imposing partial lockdowns and placing more restrictions on unvaccinated people. Germany shattered a new record today, reporting more than 65,000 new cases, with health officials warning that the true number of cases could be two or three times as many. 
In the neighboring Netherlands, more than 20,000 new cases were reported yesterday. That was a new record for a third day in a row. And in France, where a fifth wave of the pandemic is underway, the number of new cases topped 20,000 on Wednesday, a level not reached since August 2nd. Lucy Huff reports from Belgium, which is about to join Germany, the Netherlands, and the Czech Republic, among the European countries reimposing some level of pandemic social restrictions. The World Health Organization has said coronavirus deaths in Europe rose by 5% from the previous week, making it the only region in the world where COVID-19 deaths increased. In Germany, planned new restrictions would see the need for proof of vaccination or a negative COVID-19 test to access the workplace or public transport with mandatory daily testing in care homes. Sweden, the Czech Republic and Slovakia are all set to announce a COVID-19 pass. Belgium has also tightened restrictions on the wearing of face masks for anyone over 10 and has made teleworking four days a week mandatory. Lucy Hoff, Brussels. More from reporter Simon Marks. Many public health experts in the United States are taking a close look at soaring case numbers on the other side of the Atlantic after several European governments lifted many of their restrictions only to be faced now with the need to reimpose some of them. But the rise in case numbers has not in many countries been accompanied by a proportionate rise in fatalities, largely due to the widespread acceptance of vaccines, particularly in Western Europe. Each country in Europe are going through our own COVID pandemics that are determined by our own policies and our own um, immunity levels. Professor Christina Pagel is the Director of the Clinical Operational Research Unit at University College London. What we're seeing in Europe is that actually it's very, very difficult to keep COVID down without any measures. So, you know, Denmark tried, the Netherlands tried, Belgium tried, they actually, you know, got COVID really low and then released all their restrictions and cases have shut up and they've had to reintroduce them. And that's just a combination of winter and waning of not having yet vaccinated school children, which unfortunately, you know, gives the virus a place to go. Which leaves many in the US worried. A country with lower levels of full vaccination compared to many nations in Europe, and like Europe, bracing itself for colder temperatures and the winter seasons of respiratory diseases that could put fresh pressure on the country's public health systems. With FSN Spotlight... I'm Simon Marks. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA, Berkeley, KPFK, Los Angeles, KFCF, Fresno, online at kpfa.org. I'm Eileen Alfandari inviting you to join us at 7 each weekday morning for Upfront. We bring you breaking news, hard-hitting interviews, debates, and in-depth analysis. From the halls of the state capitol, to the far reaches of the globe, to the streets of Oakland. On KPFA 94.1 FM, KFCF Fresno 88.1 FM, online at kpfa.org. Join us at 7 a.m. for Upfront. President Joe Biden said today the United States is considering a diplomatic boycott of next year's Winter Olympics in Beijing over China's human rights abuses. Such a boycott would keep American dignitaries, but not U.S. athletes, from the Games. Biden made the comment to reporters today as he hosted Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau in the Oval Office. Caroline Malone reports. President Biden took a question on plans for the Olympics at a photo op with Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Some members of Congress have pushed for U.S. diplomats to boycott the Winter Games in Beijing due to start in three months' time. Something we're considering. Biden confirmed the option is still on the table. A diplomatic boycott would mean the president and other U.S. government officials would not go to the Games as a way to make a statement about China's human rights abuses. That doesn't affect athletes. Although all participants must be fully vaccinated to take part in the Games, or face 21 days quarantine. Caroline Malone, Washington. The Taliban is urging the U.S. Congress to ease sanctions and release Afghanistan's assets as the country faces economic turmoil. Foreign Minister Amir Khan Mataki said in a statement posted online that the frozen assets are harming the public from the health sector to education and other services. His comments came after the World Food Program warned that millions of people in Afghanistan are at risk of facing famine-like conditions. 
and then an additional 14.1 million are suffering acute food insecurity. Meanwhile, another deadly explosion has hit in a, a Shiite neighborhood of western Kabul, hit a minivan, killing at least one person, wounding three others. The Islamic State group has claimed responsibility for a series of bomb blasts, including several at Shiite mosques. President Biden has banned members of the Nicaraguan government from entering the United States as he issued a broad proclamation in response to an election that Washington has denounced as rigged in favor of Nicaraguan President Daniel Ortega. <clears throat> in the proclamation earlier this week, Biden suspended entry for all members of the Ortega government and other elected officials, including mayors, along with the spouses and children of those banned. The move comes after Ortega won re-election to a fourth consecutive term earlier this month, along with his wife, Vice President Rosario Murillo, after banning many opposition parties, jailing leading opposition figures, and cracking down on independent media. But some foreign policy analysts who, while questioning the fairness of the election, also see problems with the U.S. sanctions. Stephen Zunis is professor of politics at the University of San Francisco. He spoke with KPFA Saturday news anchor David Rosenberg. What stands out for me is is uh, not uh, that the, um, the criticisms of the uh, election are, are unwarranted. Uh, indeed, it was a sham election, but that the United States is the uh, biggest supporter of autocratic regimes around the world. There have been scores of uh, elections that have been even more of, uh, more dubious uh, than that of Nicaragua. And yet the uh, uh, United States has not sanctioned uh, uh, government officials or the population as a whole, as they have done in the case of Nicaragua. What do you make of the tendency on the left to defend left-wing governments no matter what, just because of the history of U.S. imperialism, the constant attacks and interventions? It's understandable, I think, given the history of the United States, particularly in, in Nicaragua, the, the, the fact the U.S. supported this uh, far-right terrorist group allied with the former Somoza regime uh, that uh, attacked civilian targets, uh, the, the mining of the harbors and economic sabotage and at a time when uh, uh, Nicaragua was uh, taking a, a very pro a progressive uh, direction of a, of, a, of a socialist revolution that had, had a, lot, a, a lot of popular support. Uh, the problem, however, is uh, uh, Zortega and uh, his, uh, his wife, his, his vice president, essentially a co-president, have uh, not only moved uh, politically to the right on a whole number of uh, economic and, and social issues, um, for example, have the most draconian abortion law in the hemisphere, but they have indeed cracked down on dissent, not just on uh, uh, right-wingers, not uh, just on centrists, but um, many uh, 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 former Sandinistas as well, who still hold out for a more progressive vision of the country. And I think it's, it's um, um, important that while indeed there are some elements of Nicaraguan opposition that are on the right, and indeed some have received some funding from uh, con congressionally uh, funded foundations and the like, that the opposition is, is genuine, is broad-based. It, it includes uh, many on, on the left that see that the country is becoming increasingly the uh, personal uh, fiefdom of uh, Ortego and, and Murillo, and that it has long abandoned the progressive uh, 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 vision of the uh, original Sandinista revolution, which many of us uh, so strongly supported back in the 1980s. Political science professor Stephen Zunas teaches at the University of San Francisco. The Canadian Pacific Coast province of British Columbia has declared a state of emergency following floods and mudslides caused by extremely heavy rainfall. Officials say they expect to recover bodies of those who've perished. Every major route between the lower mainland of British Columbia, where Canada's third largest city of Vancouver is located, and the interior of the province has been cut by washouts, flooding, or landslides. Premier John Horgan says the state of emergency will include Include travel restrictions, so transportation of essential goods, medical and emergency services will reach the communities that need them. Already strained supply lines are at risk of greater disruption. Therefore, 
As of noon today, the government of BC is declaring a state of emergency. There's not a person that hasn't been affected or will not be affected by the events of this past weekend. These events are increasing in regularity because of the effects of human-caused climate change. More from reporter Iris Spitzer. One woman has been killed in a landslide, and officials say several other people are missing. The region received its usual monthly rainfall total in just 24 hours, and more rain is expected in the coming days. The city of Vancouver, which is home to Canada's largest port, has been largely cut off with many highways and rail links closed as a result of the high water. Ira Spitzer, San Francisco. Premier Horgan said that over the past six months, there have been drought conditions in the province where the Coldwater River was at its lowest point in living memory and where people had to be evacuated because of wildfires and temperatures that were unprecedented. And now, he says, much of the community is underwater. Thousands of animals have died. A Canadian Earth Sciences professor says the weather events are all connected and can be attributed to climate change. The Hayward Unified School District in Northern California voted to close two elementary schools next year at its meeting last night. The Board of Education was proposing to close eight schools. But teachers, students, and parents rallied at the board meeting and urged them to cancel the proposed closures. According to a statement from the California Teachers Association, the board postponed closing other schools and agreed to explore other options to keep them open. San Francisco's prestigious Lowell High School cannot adopt a lottery system for admission. San Francisco... Superior Court has ruled the Board of Education's decision to use a lottery system was made without proper notice to the community and denied the public its right to notice and comment. The ruling's a win for opponents of a lottery system. Supporters of the lottery system argued it would help create educational equity by allowing students from other areas admission to the prestigious school. Groups like the Lowell Alumni Association and the Asian American Legal Foundation challenged the change. Students in Colorado, some of whom say they're Native American, are suing the state over its ban on Indian school mascots and nicknames. Robin Vincent of the Mountain West News Bureau has the story. Barbara Creel is director of the Southwest Indian Law Clinic at University of New Mexico and a member of the Pueblo of Jemez. She says the complaint presents some broader questions, such as... Is a lawsuit like this going to deter other states from doing the right thing? And the answer is yes, because it... It's very costly. Lawsuits are costly. And that is why the plaintiffs bring such a lawsuit. That some of the plaintiffs claim to have tribal affiliations could give the lawsuit traction, Creel says. Still, many advocates point out Native American mascots harm indigenous people, especially youth. Colorado enacted its law in June. Nevada passed similar legislation then, too. They're among at least 20 states banning Native American mascots. No other Mountain West states are on that list. But some schools have taken it upon themselves, like the Bountiful High Braves in Utah, which became the Red Hawks this year. I'm Robin Vincent. California's Independent Legislative Analyst Office is forecasting that the state will have a $31 billion budget surplus next year. The predicted surplus so large that the office estimates it could exceed a constitutional limit on state spending by more than $26 billion over three years. That could require Governor Gavin Newsom and state lawmakers to either cut taxes, spend more money on infrastructure, or give rebates to taxpayers. California's tax collections have continued to soar from April to June of this year. California businesses reported a 38.8% increase in taxable sales. The Legislative Analyst Office says it's impossible to know whether those revenue gains are sustainable. Newsom won't reveal his budget proposal until January, but he has indicated he's favoring giving some of the money back to taxpayers. 
cloudy tomorrow in the San Francisco Bay Area with a high of 60 degrees around the bay into the low 60s further inland. Partly cloudy in the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow with highs in the mid 60s. Mostly cloudy in Los Angeles with highs in the upper 60s. That's it for the news tonight. I'm Mark Miracle. Good evening. Tune in Thursday nights, starting at 7 p.m. for Apex Express, a weekly magazine-style radio show featuring the voices and stories of Asians and Asian Americans from all corners of their communities. Then at 8, it's a unique mix of singer-songwriter, folk, rock, soul, country, and R&B on The Bonnie Simmons Show. Finally, at 10 p.m., The Here and Now with Dirk Richardson, bringing you a mix of singer-songwriters to avant-garde jazz, old faves, new voices, and live performances. That's Thursday nights on 94.1 KPFA and kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online worldwide at kpfa.org.